That brings us to chapter 4 here. And we see now the return of Moses to Egypt and the announcement of the deliverance to Israel. But Moses, he has a great many hurdles to get over and a great many questions in his mind. Now notice, "...and Moses answered and said, But behold, they shall not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee." That would be a natural answer, would it not? And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. Now that rod will become the badge of authority for Moses, because he's going to use it in many different ways. But now here is the first. He said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And I think it was a vicious monster, by the way. The thing to make sure is that actually there'll be no power in that rod at all. It could be an instrument of Satan just as well. It could be satanic. It must be used for God. It's just like if you've got a dollar bill in your pocket. You take that dollar bill out, that dollar bill could have been used to help pay for a murder. It could be used for prostitution, it can be used for gambling, it can be used for liquor, and that sort of thing. In other words, that dollar bill can become a serpent, friends. It's only when it's put in the hand of a man of God who's moving at the hand of God that it can be used for God, you see. This is a tremendous lesson that God is giving here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. He put forth his hand, caught it, became a rod in his hand. A great many people say to me well, about television, it's of the devil. And you remember years ago they used to say of the automobile, it's of the devil. They used to say it of radio, that it's of the devil. Sure, the devil can use it. He uses all these instruments. Sure, the radio is of the devil. It can be used to the devil, but grab that serpent by the tail and help keep the through the Bible radio on the air, friends, and make it a rod in the hand of God today. I get a little weary of a lot of these super pious people saying, oh, that's of the devil. And they never give a dime to keep these Christian radio programs on the air. They never try to get a Christian message on TV. And they never use their automobile to bring some dear saint to church. May I say to you, grab the old serpent by the tail and use it for God today. We need to do that. Now, God's not through teaching Moses these great spiritual lessons. We're going to see something else. And God says that rod in your hand will become an instrument that will convince the elders. So God puts into that rod when it's used according to the will of God in the hand of a man that's yielded to God, it will become his badge of authority. And I believe that a man today, any man that will take the Word of God and preach it as the Spirit of God leads him without any bias or prejudice, I'm confident that God will bless that to the hearts of those that hear Therefore, we saw that that rod could be an instrument of Satan. It could become a serpent. But when Moses would take it, would return and become a rod. You will note also now that God gives him another assurance, and it is an important lesson for him as he assumes this great responsibility. I'm reading now verse 6 of the fourth chapter of Exodus. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. He put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. Behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. The great message that is here, of course, is one that is for Moses in particular. 
the bosom speaks of his inner life. We would say today, the heart, out of the heart proceed the issues of life. Then this man puts his hand in there. In other words, the hand will do what's in the heart. Now, you see, God, first of all, wanted to get that rod in the hand of a man yielded to him. But he wants that hand now in accord with the heart of the man. The heart must be in this, because ultimately a man will do what's in his heart. That which is in the heart will come out. Out of the heart come the issues of life. The Lord Jesus himself, you remember, made this statement concerning, he says, a good tree brings forth good fruit, and an evil tree brings forth evil fruit. And then he went on to say that it's the heart. That is the place where the issues of life are settled, and that becomes actually all important, by the way. And so we find that he makes that very clear to us today. Let me just read a verse in this connection. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 6:45, "...a good man..." Out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. And so now what God is saying to this man Moses, that I want your heart and your hand. And friends, I want to make this very clear. God today is putting it on the same kind of basis. God doesn't want your money, and he doesn't want what you do. He wants you. And if he gets you, then he'll have the rest. And he's saying to Moses, Moses, that hand, you put it in the bosom, it comes out as leprosy. You put it in again, it'll come out clean. Now, out of that heart will come ultimately what you are. In other words, I want that rod in the hand of a man that is yielded to me, and I want that hand to move because his heart is moving the same way, which ultimately means I want his heart yielded to me. That's a great lesson. And it was a lesson for Moses. It'll be for the children of Israel, and it's for us today. Now you read in verse 10, Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Well, the thing is that Moses puts up another objection. Moses said, I'm not an eloquent speaker. You need an eloquent speaker here. Well, the thing is, again, he's making an excuse. Moses was able, I notice, to speak when it was time to speak. And he seems to have done a very good job of it. But you notice that now he feels his inadequacy. And that is perfectly all right. But it's also now the time has come for action, and God wants him to move. Notice verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. In other words, what he's saying again is, Moses, not only I want that hand, but I want your mouth also. And if I have it, you'll say what I want you to say. And that, again, is very important. Out of the heart proceed the issues of life. And what is in the well of the heart will come up through the bucket of the mouth. You see, God wanted his heart. Then God could have that man speak what he wanted to. But Moses puts this up as an objection. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Poor Moses is trying to get a substitute here. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he'll be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. 
and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shall be to him instead of God. In other words, this man Aaron, his brother, will be his spokesman, and God will use Aaron. But this was a great mistake of Moses. You see, God didn't want a divided command. And you will find out that it caused problems as they went along through the wilderness. We'll discover that when we get over in the book of Numbers. And we're going to discover that when this man made a golden calf, you'll recall. That was a terrible blunder that this man Aaron made. Now, you see, it came as a result of divided command. God didn't need Aaron. All he needed was Moses. But you see, Moses' reluctance. Now, there are two things here. One is, we need to recognize our weakness. But when God calls us, we ought to move out. This man Moses, you see, is so reluctant, holding back, that God had to put another man with him. And that was not good. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, and see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said unto Moses, Go in peace. Moses certainly got along well with his father-in-law. But frankly, we still have the question here about Mrs. Moses, about his wife here. And you'll recall that I said we would return to this subject, and I raised some questions about Moses' home life before. Well, we're going to get a little added detail here. Let me read, beginning verse 19. The Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. Now, you see, there is a new Pharaoh in Egypt, the one that actually would have been his father, by adoption, is now dead, and so he can return back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. Now, God says here he'll harden his heart, and that's always presented a problem. Now, in view of the fact that when we get to the plagues, we come to that again, I trust that you will permit me to wait until we get there before I go into that, because that does have, I think, a very satisfactory solution. I'm reading at verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I'll slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now, you see how God was lenient with Pharaoh and with the Egyptians when he went down. He didn't put it on this basis immediately. He told Pharaoh at the very beginning, he said, "'Either you let my son Israel go, or I'll slay your son.'" But you see, there were many plagues that came in between. In other words, God gave Pharaoh an opportunity to save his own son, but he didn't avail himself of that. And now I read verse 24, "'It came to pass by the way in the end.'" that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now, this is a strange verse. But this reveals now the third real big objection. And this is Moses' neglect of the most important rite, which was circumcision, which was the seal of the covenant God had made at the beginning with Abraham. And it was very important. Now, notice this little incident here. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art. 
because of the circumcision. That's an incident that is very difficult, I grant you, to look at. Now let's come back and look at the home life of Moses, or I'd like for you to meet now Mr. and Mrs. Moses. We have, first of all, the romance of Moses and this daughter of the priest of Midian. We saw that he had to flee from Egypt. He's a fugitive from Egypt. And he went here to Midian, and the Midianites, remember, were the offspring of Abraham. You see, when Abraham married Keturah, why, Midian was one of the offspring. That means they were monotheistic in their worship. And I believe that Moses was more at home in Midian than he was in Egypt, because, you see, his mother had trained him in Egypt about their background. And now he meets a people who are monotheistic. That means they worship one God. They were not idolaters. And it was in Asia where he'd gone out in the Sinaitic Peninsula. It was a desert wasteland. Now, this priest of Midian had these seven daughters, and he really had a job on his hands getting rid of them. And Moses and the priest of Midian became very close friends, as we have learned. And here, notice, he just let him go, let him return back to the land of Egypt. In other words, he didn't attempt to hinder him in any way. Now, the one that he had married was Zipporah, that is, the daughter of the priest of Midian that Moses had married. Her name was Zipporah, and that sounds like a modern gadget to take the place of buttons, by the way. Actually, as we've said before, it means sparrow or really birdie, a little bird, birdie. <laughs> May I say to you that here you have the first lady bird, and this was the wife of Moses. The word, though, means a little birdie, not an old bird or, or an old crow or something like that. The same thing's true. You call a little girl. You call her a kitten. When she gets old, you better not call her an old cat. You'd be in trouble. And I think Zippero must have been her father's favorite with this name. He called her Birdie. It was a pet name. Now, God bless this home of Moses at the beginning. The boy that was born there was Gershom, the firstborn. And that means a stranger. Moses was a stranger in that land. And now he has a home there. And Moses gets a bride while rejected by his brethren, and Christ got a bride, or he's getting a bride while being rejected by the world. We saw the same thing was true of Joseph. You see, these are glorious portraits we have in the Word of God. Now, if this were the entire record, well, I'd have to conclude that everything was proceeding nicely in the home of Moses. But now will you notice that I've just read to you the redemption and regeneration of Zipporah. God called Moses at the burning bush, and so now he must return to Egypt. Pharaoh's dead. Moses starts his journey to Egypt. And then this strange thing, God attempted to kill him. Why? Well, circumcision was the badge and the seal of the covenant with Abraham, and it was to teach them they were to have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh should be cut away. Their confidence is to be in God. And that was the thing that was true of Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And we find Isaac and Jacob had followed along in the same way and the same ritual. Circumcision was the badge of it. And so it was an act of faith for them to perform that rite. And we are told today, to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become sons of God. That was the evidence that they were sons of Abraham. That's an evidence of their faith. Now, apparently, Zipporah had resisted this ordinance. Moses had neglected this right. Perhaps he forgot it, didn't think it was important, did not want to precipitate a marital rift. After all, Zipporah didn't want it done. Zipporah's monotheistic, but she thought probably this was a foolish and bloody thing to do. In fact, she says that here. She's not atheistic. She's just resisting the ordinance of God. 
And Moses didn't make an issue of it. Moses could stand up against Pharaoh, but he couldn't stand up against his wife. Moses could oppose Israel when they were wrong, but he didn't oppose his wife when she is wrong. Moses lay hold of God in prayer, but he couldn't persuade his wife. Moses apparently thought that he would get by with it. He'd just slide along, take it easy. And I think Christian workers sometimes get in that position. Preachers and missionaries and Christian workers sometimes neglect their own home while they're out trying to fix up everybody else's. Well, God intervened here with Moses, and he waylaid him, and he revealed the seriousness of the situation. And friends, there's a real danger when husband and wife do not agree completely in spiritual matters. That's the reason Scripture warns against believers and unbelievers marrying. That at the very beginning we saw the sons of God looked on the daughters of man, and it's not good. And mixed marriages, they just don't somehow or another work out. And Zipporah was the one who performed the right to save Moses' life. I think God would have slain Moses. And it was, therefore, on her part an act of faith. She came under the covenant of Abraham and claimed the promises. This is redemption of blood, no confidence in the flesh. Now, a little later on, we're going to find that Moses' father-in-law brought Zipporah to him. And you have the reconciliation of the two. I'm of the opinion that at this particular point, we know she started out with Moses. And I think when they got to Egypt, that Moses, when he saw the problem and the difficulty, he probably sent her back home to be with her father. And then her father, later on, we'll see that. When we get to the 18th chapter of Exodus, he brings her after they're out on the wilderness march. Now, let me leave that and conclude this chapter at verse 27. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he'd commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. And this is a great scene that we have here, a great worship scene of these people now turning in faith to God. And it will be on this basis now that God's going to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now today, friends, as we come to the fifth chapter, there's something that I probably should mention because it's going to come up again and again in the Old Testament and that is the relationship of the individual Israelite to God. He was never called the individual Israelite a son of God. But we saw back in chapter 4, verse 22, the thing that God did say of the nation. And I was so busy talking about the home life of Moses that I didn't speak of the home life of the nation. Now, let me read this. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Now, the nation as such was considered a son of God. And I think each individual Israelite, and we'll have to see this as we go along, had to have that experience of the new birth to come in under the covenant. You see, the sign of it, as we've already seen, was circumcision, and that was the badge of it. But as Paul made very clear, you will recall to the Galatians, he said, "...for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation." In other words, there are a great many people today even boast of the fact that they don't belong to a church and they don't do this and they don't go through a ritual and all of that. 
Well, my friend, that's nothing to crow about, nothing to boast of, whether you have or have not. It's the inward experience. It is to have experienced the new birth. And I believe that the individual Israelite had to go through that. But the nation as such was called the Son of God, and each one had to come in under that badge, which was circumcision outwardly, but you see it spoke of an inward relationship. Now, we'll have a great deal more to say about that from time to time, especially when God sent the nation into captivity. Now, here in chapter 5, we begin actually a new section, and it's the contest now with Pharaoh. And I'd like to say something preliminary about this as we'll move rather hurriedly after we get going in this section. You see, now what has happened is this. Moses appears back in Egypt after 40 years' absence. Now, God is ready to deliver his people. And the deliverer now is prepared. Moses is prepared. And Moses was to assemble the elders of Israel, and they're all to go to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh will refuse. And that refusal will open the struggle between God and the gods of Egypt. Actually, it was not a battle between the people of Egypt or the nation Egypt. It was against the gods of Egypt. And the plagues actually were not haphazard. In other words, when God sent the plague of frogs, he didn't say, well, now I wonder what I can think of to do next. The fact of the matter is that probably nothing was quite as organized and as meaningful as these plagues. They were directed very definitely at certain institutions in Egypt, and that was the idolatry of Egypt. And the thing that was going to happen, as we'll see here, Pharaoh is going to ask the question, who is the Lord? I don't know him, and don't intend to let his people go. Well, God's going to introduce himself, and he'll do it by bringing these plagues on the land of Egypt. Now, over in the seventh chapter, verse 5, the Lord makes it clear what he had in mind. And the Egyptians shall know that I'm the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. You see, he not only delivered his people, but by the plagues he let the Egyptians know who he was, because each plague was leveled at the different gods of Egypt. And believe me, they had gods many. I'll go into detail in this after today when we take up each plague separately. But there were literally thousands of temples in Egypt, and there were millions of idols and about 3,000 different gods in Egypt. Now, that will outdo anything we've got in this country today. There was power in the religion of Egypt. Somebody's going to say, you don't mean that. Well, I certainly do mean it, friends. There was power in that. The Egyptians were not fools. I don't know why that we today always arrogate to ourselves a superior knowledge to the people of the past because we have a transistor radio. We have color television. We've been to the moon, and that means we're superior and know something. Don't you know that all of our knowledge is based on that which has been handed down by the past? And if we've been building just like you put up a wall, one stone on another, down through the centuries. And these people in the past were not fools. And Paul, I think, makes it very clear that there was power in the religions of Egypt. Over in Second Timothy, the third chapter, verse 8, he says, "...now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses." So do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. And I think it was satanic. I've always felt that the Greeks really got a great deal of fireworks from Mount Olympus, but it was satanic. And Satan grants power to them that worship him. The oracle of Delphi is an example of that. Spiritism today. Now, the plagues were directed at the gods of Egypt against idolatry, against Pharaoh, against Satan. And I like to call it a battle of the gods 
for that's exactly what it was. And listen to the 12th chapter of Exodus, verse 12, and this was the last plague. Listen to this. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I'm the Lord. It definitely is a battle of the gods. It's God directing these plagues against the idolatry of Egypt. Now, to reveal to Israel, of course, the ability of God to deliver was another very important lesson there. You see, they were born in brickyards, and they were in idolatry, and God had to show them that he was superior, that he could deliver them. Now, let me run through these plagues very briefly, just to let you see that there's some sense to them. Moses first changed the rod into a serpent, and the wise men of Egypt do that. That was something that reveals that Satan has certain power, which is quite definite. Now, the Nile was turned to blood. The fertility of that land depended upon the overflow of the Nile to bring both fertilizer and water. And it was sacred, the Nile sacred to Osiris. There were pagan rites every spring. Life became death now. And before, the Nile spoke of life. But now it's death, it's blood. And then the frogs, they were dirty and ugly. And the very interesting thing is that the Egyptians worshipped about every animal that was imaginable. They worshipped Hika, the frog-headed goddess, and it was a fence to kill frogs. But, my friend, when you get up of a morning, there are frogs in bed with you, frogs on the floor, frogs in the kitchen. You have a mind to want to kill them, but they're all sacred, you see. And then you have here the fact that the magicians in Egypt duplicated up to this point. But from here on, they're out of business. The next one was the lice, and the magicians could not duplicate this one. And it makes you believe maybe the others were fake that they did, but at least there was a duplication. Now, Keb was the earth god, and lice were made out of the dust of the earth. That, to me, is a very interesting thing. Then the judgment of the flies, and that is the scarab. That's what they find in the tombs today. It speaks of eternal life, the beetles, if you please. They were sacred to Ra, the sun god, Ra Ammon, and Kippara. And then the murrain on the cattle. Well, Egypt was a land of zoolatry. They worshipped the whole animal kingdom, and Apis especially, the black bull, and may I say to you, it's rather ridiculous. They're now going to have to worship a sick cow. Don't tell me there's not humor in the Bible. And I think God must have smiled about this time. And then the boils, there was hail. And this is where now God begins to demonstrate his power. Isis, the great god of the air, of the atmosphere. And he's moving in on them now. Locusts, the crops were cursed. And that is an evidence of the judgment of God. We find that in the book of Joel and Revelation. And then darkness. You see, Egyptians worship the sun, Ra Ammon, that disk with the rays going out from it. I know when I was in Egypt in the museums and around the old buildings, the ruins that are there, you see this sign over the doorway, Ra Ammon. It's the disk of the sun and rays shooting out from it. Well, the sun's blotted out in this darkness in Egypt. And then the tenth one, the death of the firstborn. And the firstborn belonged to the gods of Egypt. In other words, God just took what belonged to the gods of Egypt. This was a tremendous thing, you see, that God is doing here. He's teaching the Egyptians, and he's convincing Pharaoh. And he's also bringing his own people where they are willing to acknowledge him. Now, I think it's important to see that, friends, because it lifts this record out of an account that some would like to make it rather ridiculous. Well, it's not ridiculous. You can imagine the idolatry that was in Egypt. And God, by the way, through Isaiah, predicted later on every idol would disappear from the land of Egypt. And you know today they're Muslim down there. And they don't permit idols at all. 
And the land that was loaded with more idols, probably than any land, that includes Babylon, every one of them's disappeared. And you go to old Memphis, and God said that this is the city that he would absolutely remove every idol. And the only thing that's left there is that great big statue of the Pharaoh that was so vain. And it's all broken up, but it's a tremendous, huge thing. They've got a building over it now. It was formerly just right out in the big outdoors. Now, that gives us something of the background that we have here. Now, as I come to chapter 5, will you notice as we move through this record, verse 1, I'm reading, "...and afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness." Now, you see that this was to be the first step. They didn't go in and say, let my people go. We're leaving here. We're going to the promised land. But that's not it. Just let us go out in the wilderness and worship. That's preparing him or softening him up for what is ultimately coming, of course. But notice the reaction of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, "'Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go.'" Two things, you see. I don't know the Lord, and I don't intend to let Israel go. Well, He certainly doesn't know the Lord, or he'd say, I'm going to let Israel go. But he's going to get acquainted. And this is part of the purpose of the plagues. Verse 3, And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. In other words, God will judge us if we do not take this step now. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you under your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. In other words, Moses was having mass meetings of these people, and they were restless now. They wanted to go, and this Pharaoh sees that he's presented with a real problem. He says, you get back to your work, and he sends them back to the brickyards and now increases their problem and their difficulties. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves." And the tail of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them, ye shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. In other words, they were asking for a holiday. And he said, There's nothing doing. You're not working hard enough. And their task is increased by the withholding of straw from them. The very interesting thing is that Dr. Melvin Grove Kyle, that I've referred to before in this study in Egypt, he was an Egyptologist, and I had the privilege of being under him as a seminary student for a time. And Dr. Kyle brought to the class one day a brick that he had taken out of the city of Ramesses, out of the ruins. And you find that the first brick that were there were made with straw, but up at the top. And he said these that were on top were brick that had been made without straw. This is uh, apparently a historical record, you see. That is, that can be corroborated and substantiated from the brick that are there. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe the record, not because they found some brick over in Egypt, but because God has said it. But it's interesting to note that it has been confirmed. Now, we find that the task is increased for these people. And it was something that was hard on them. Actually, before they served with rigor, we are told. Now, will you note, and I'm dropping down to verse 15. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? 
there is no straw given unto thy servants. And they say to us, Make brick, and behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work. For there shall no straw be given you, yet shall you deliver the tale of brick. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case after it was said, Ye shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily tasks. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you. And judge, because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. In other words, Moses and Aaron, the thing you've done, you haven't helped us, but you've given Pharaoh an excuse to make our burden more difficult than it ever was before. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people, why is it that thou hast sent me? You would think at this point that Moses was complaining. And there's always been a question, is Moses complaining here? I think so. I think that Moses came down to deliver the children of Israel, and he felt like, my, they'd certainly be for him since he wanted to deliver the people. But things are not working out like he had anticipated. And I feel like that he is complaining. And now verse 23, For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. And Moses is complaining. He's rather impatient. He said, I've come down here to deliver them at your instructions. I've delivered the message. And instead of Pharaoh calling me in and saying, all right, here's your passport, you can go. Instead of that, he's made their difficulty much harder than it was. But you see, God is moving slowly, patiently, which is his way. And here in chapter 6 now, he wants to encourage his servant. He also wants to encourage the people of Israel and teach them. And he has a little message for Pharaoh also. Now I'm reading in chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord will deal with Moses. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. This is Jehovah now speaking, the self-existing one. God doesn't have any reserves. He doesn't fill a pantry full of foodstuff so that he won't starve. God doesn't have to make preparation for the future. He is the self-existing one. I am the Lord. He's not dependent upon anything in creation. He doesn't lean on anything. The whole business leans on him, my beloved. Now, will you notice what he's doing here to this man Moses? He's giving him the continuity now that has come down from the days of Abraham. Listen to him, verse 3, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. He was the Almighty God, the Creator, the Deliverer. But now He is the self-existing One and the One who is able to deliver these people. Will you notice the number of times, by the way, friends, that the personal pronoun I is it refers to God. I am the Lord. I appeared unto Abraham. I appeared unto Isaac. I appeared unto Jacob. And I was not known by the name of Jehovah to them. Now, verse 4, And I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. 
Now you have here this tremendous emphasis upon what God is going to do. Will you listen to him? Verse 5, "...and I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage." And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Now, there begins here the seven I wills of God, what he's going to do. And they are the seven I wills of redemption. And for us, it is a marvelous portrait and picture today. But it was a great encouragement to Moses in that day. God says who he is. And now he says what he's going to do. And you and I have a Savior today. He is who he says he is. And he's able to save to the uttermost. Now he says what he's going to do for them. And you have seven I wills. And these are the seven I wills of redemption. They begin here at verse 6 now, chapter 6 of Exodus. I'm reading. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And believe me, he said that quite a few times also. Now the first I will, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Number two, and I will rid you out of their bondage. Three, And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Four, and I will take you to me for a people. And fifth, and I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Then the sixth one, verse 8, And I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And now number seven, And I will give it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. Now these are the seven I wills of redemption. God says to these people, he said, first of all, I'm going to bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, the corollary and the parallel to our redemption is here. The burden of sin today, the things of the world are a burden today to the heart. And we're told to love, not the world. But God delivers us from the burden of sin. And then he says, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and he'll deliver you from the slavery of sin. I have one of the most remarkable letters, and friends, we are receiving right now some of the most remarkable letters that I think that I've ever received. I'm convinced in my own heart that God is using this Bible study not in just some little surface way to entertain people or to even give them knowledge, but the Spirit of God is reaching down today in depth into many hearts and transforming them. I have a letter, and I won't even say where it's from. It's from a man that I would have said, and frankly, I don't think I would have spent much time personally talking with him. But yet I've been talking to him now for, I think, a couple of years. And this man has had a great transformation. He's a brilliant young man to begin with. And he started out in sin, and I mean in sin. I think that he probably has today a half a dozen illegitimate children. And not from just one, but each one is separate. He's had an affair after an affair. Added to that in his work has not been altogether honest in it. And then he got religious. And he entered the priesthood, studied for the priesthood. And then he fell in love with a girl that wanted to be a nun. And they had an affair. I'm not sure whether they got married or not. But then even his own relatives, I don't know whether it was his brother or cousin's wife, he had an affair with her. I mean, this fellow's been in sin. He was in the service. 
And he attempted to help the chaplain in the service of all things. This man has had as checkered a career as anybody that I've ever heard of. And yet the Word of God has reached down into this man's life. He told me how he began to listen to it. And it just took days for the darkness to roll away and the light to break through into his heart and life. And he said, I'm now trusting the Lord Jesus. And he's married this last one that he's had an affair with, and she's his wife. But he still has the impinging of conscience upon him that, yes, God has forgiven him. I'm going to try to be helpful to him now by writing to him because he wonders whether he ought to even live with this woman. He says he and his wife feel like maybe they're living in sin because of their past. May I say to you, God has reached down in his life and redeemed him. Now, that's the business God is in. Look at these people in the land of Egypt. The burdens are upon them. They're in bondage. And God says, I'm going to take you out of here. I'm going to rid you of the bondage. And I'm going to redeem you with a stretched out arm. And that's that mighty bared arm that Isaiah said, "...who hath believed our report, and to whom is the bared arm of the Lord revealed?" Well, I don't know who it's revealed to. I didn't know that fellow was listening in. But God knew, and God reached down and did a work in his life. And we are receiving letter after letter like that today. God's doing a work today, friends, in hearts and lives, and it's the work of redemption, and he's reaching down. It's not this little silly stuff that we came through today about Jesus this and Jesus that, and no mention of sin. The idea today that you can sort of cuddle up to him and he'll be your friend. May I say to you, my friend, what you need is a Savior from sin, because in his sight you are corrupt, and you will have to deal with that. He died. He loves you enough to die for you to make it possible to be saved. And if he had to do that, you're going to have to come to him as that kind of a sinner in order to be saved. This is the great plan of salvation right here. The seven I wills of redemption. This is the way God saves you. Listen to him. I will take you to me for a people. And just think, lifting us out of the muck and the mire and making us his son by faith in Christ Jesus. Now he says, and I'll be to you a God. Now, he just didn't lift us out of the muck and the mire to make us orphans and run off and leave us. He says, I'm going to be your God. And I don't believe, friend, you're saved. If you tell me today that, oh, you believed in Jesus, but you're going on living without him and living today as if he does not exist, and some actually living in sin tell me, oh, I've trusted Jesus. No, you haven't. You've had some little sissy experience that has done nothing for your life. My friend, when you trust him, it'll transform your life, and he'll become your God, and you'll bow down to him, and you'll acknowledge him as your God. That's the thing that he's talking about here. I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I'm the Lord your God. God wants you to know something, friend. He wants you to know that you're saved. He wants you to know Christ. He wants you to know him, which bringeth you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, has God saved you from something? Somebody says, well, I don't know. You don't know, then you're not saved. When he saves, he saves you from something. I'll bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, not only does he save us from something, I'll bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Canaan today is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the Christian life as believers should be living it today. Have you crossed over Jordan? I have a little book on that. Have you crossed over Jordan through the death and resurrection of Christ? Are you living today in the life and light and love of a living Savior? That's important, friends. 
That's very important, and it's very real, by the way. Now, verse 8 again, "...and I will give it to you for a heritage. I'm the Lord." We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. And Paul, in the fifth chapter of Romans, makes it clear, "...having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ." We have access to Him. Oh, we have joy in the midst of trouble. And we've been given the Holy Spirit. And the love of God has been made real to us. And we're delivered from wrath to come. We're delivered from the great tribulation period. What kind of salvation do you have today, friends, that you're talking about that has not transformed your life and hasn't really redeemed you from something? Say, this is a great passage of Scripture, is it not? Here's the picture of your salvation and my salvation. Now, will you notice verse 9? And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. And your heart must go out to these people at a time like this. They just couldn't believe Moses because he hadn't helped them. He'd hurt them, really. Now, notice verse 10, "...and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land." And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me, How then shall Pharaoh hear me, who am of uncircumcised lips? The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel, and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. In other words, he was not accepted, that is, Moses was not accepted by the children of Israel, and he's not accepted by Pharaoh, and he's reluctant to go into Pharaoh again and make a demand. Well, God's commissioned him. God says, you go on in there. In other words, he's to look to God at a time like this and not to circumstances. Now, we have here something that to me is very strange. In the midst of all of this, these difficulties, God is very careful. He's very careful to give us the families again. That's important as far as the Old Testament is concerned. It's very important to know who we're talking about. And the genealogy became all important. In verse 14, "...these be the heads of their fathers' houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel." And again, here we go through all of this. And I'm not going to go through it, friends, because I'd be honest with you, All it is is a bunch of names. I could go to sleep reading these names. But just because they're a little boring to me doesn't mean they're not important. It just means it's not a thrilling record here of anything except to God. God was very, very, very insistent that the genealogies be recorded, that we know who we're talking about. And he has the same thing for you and me today. He wants us to be his children, and he wants us to be sons of God through faith in Christ. But we want to be sure about that. We want to be sure about it. Now, in verse 16, these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. And this will come up later, and it's important. You have Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. These were the three sons, and they are the ones that will take the tabernacle through the wilderness. It's quite interesting. The children of Israel today, the average Jew, could not tell you what tribe he belongs to. But back here, they had to be sure of these things because, you see, it's a genealogy leading to Jesus Christ. And then we have in verse 18, the sons of Kohath, Amram and Izhar and Hebron. And you will notice that Amram's named after the father of Moses. And here we have verse 20. And Amram took him Jochebed, his father's sister to wife, and she bare him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were a hundred thirty and seven years. Someone has asked me the question, well, 
Aaron was Moses' brother. Well, when Aaron was born, didn't he have the same problem they'd have with Moses? No, Aaron was older than Moses, and the decree of old Pharaoh hadn't probably been put in at that time. It was not until he saw the way they were increasing. Now you have here this genealogy that we have before us, and I'm going to pass over it and come all the way down to verse 26 now. These are that Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, "'Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are they which spake to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron.'" In other words, at this juncture, when both Pharaoh and the children of Israel themselves, the circumcised would not accept them, the uncircumcised would not. And Moses is pretty discouraged. Well, what about it then? Well, it's at this point that God gives his background of who he is. He has to be who he claims to be before he can deliver the children of Israel. There are those today that try to tell me that the virgin birth is not essential. May I say to you, it's absolutely essential. Then somebody comes and says, well, you don't have to believe the virgin birth to be saved. Now, will you listen to me very carefully about this? When I came to Christ, I never heard of the virgin birth. You don't have to trust his birth to be saved. You trust his death and resurrection to be saved. But wait just a minute. When you are saved, you'll come to know him. And when you come to know him, you'll find out he's virgin-born. And if he was not virgin-born, then you made a mistake in trusting him because he's not who he claimed to be. So you see, it's not essential to believe the virgin birth to be saved, but no one who's been saved will deny the virgin birth they cannot. This thing, my friend, is... Very important and essential. Moses and Aaron have to be who they claim to be. They are in the family of Levi. They belong to that line. And their father and mother are Amram and Jochebed. You see, this man Moses was brought up in Pharaoh's court there 40 years. He's been 40 years out yonder in the desert of Midian. He's married the priest of Midian's daughter. Now, here he is back in the land. Who are you, anyway? Well, here's who he is. The credentials are very important. In fact, they're all important here. Now, God, on that basis, renews his call to Moses and to Aaron. Verse 28, "...it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I am the Lord." Speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh hearken unto me? Moses again making excuses, you see. It's not a very pleasant task that he has. He's been rejected all the way long. He says, After all, I'm Moses, my father and mother, Amram and Jochebed, and we're in the line of Levi, Levi was the son of Jacob, and Jacob a son of Isaac, and Isaac a son of Abraham, and God made the promises to Abraham, I'm in the right line. But he doesn't have very much faith. He said, they rejected me, and I hesitate to go. Now, in chapter 7, verse 1, notice what God says to Moses. He's having a little trouble with Moses, by the way. And the Lord said unto Moses, See... I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. That is, he'll speak for you. You remember, he had complained about the fact that he was not eloquent, and now Aaron is to be his prophet. Now, this, by the way, is the finest definition I think you'll find of a prophet. It's given here in an illustration, you see. Moses will be a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron will speak for him, and Aaron will be a prophet. Now, God has sent prophets to speak to his people in the past. These prophets 
you see, are those who speak for God. A prophet is one who has a message from God to the people. And he's the very opposite of a priest. A prophet comes out from God and goes to the people. The priest represents the people, and he comes from the people, and he goes to God representing them. Therefore, a priest is not to speak for God, and a prophet is not to represent the people. He's to represent God. And Aaron now is to represent Moses before the people, and Moses is representing God before both the people and Pharaoh. That, I think, is something that is here that God would have us know. Now, will you notice the battle has not been joined between the gods of Egypt and the Lord God of Israel, but we are coming to it now. You see, everything had been preparation. God was preparing the children of Israel. He was preparing Moses and Aaron, and he has been preparing actually old Pharaoh for the engagement now that's going to take place. And this man, Moses, is to go in and join the battle. He'll throw the gauntlet down. Here only the thing he'll throw down will be the rod that's in his hand. Now, will you notice, Aaron will do the speaking, but Moses is to be there to tell him what to say. Now, that has always raised the question of whether Moses was tongue-tied or whether he stuttered or whether he had some impediment of speech. I personally do not think so. My feeling is that Moses' impediment was actually psychological, was actually a fear that he had in his own heart, and he needed bolstering up. Forty years in the wilderness, you see, had brought him to the place that he was not adequate to deliver the children of Israel. And God wanted to make it very clear that it was God delivering them and not Moses. And that's one of the reasons that it's so difficult for God to move today, even in the church, or in the lives and hearts of many of us, because in the church today, the church is taking credit, or some organization, and then there's some individual Christian that's taking credit. And when we are always getting in the way to take the credit, then the hand of God, the mighty bared arm of God is not revealed. The human element has to be put out of the way, has to be put to the side. God cannot use the flesh. Paul said, I know that within me, that is, within my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now, friends, if you don't believe that, then you believe God. He said that. And it's mighty hard for some of us to think that there's not a little good in us because we've been counting on it. We've been relying on it in time of an emergency. But God doesn't want it. God won't use it. God cannot use it. God has set the flesh aside. And so now Aaron will speak for Moses. Now listen, verse 2, "...thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of the land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt." And maybe at this time I ought to take a moment, because it will come up later, and say a word about what does it mean to harden the Pharaoh's heart. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes, he did, but only in the way that he means it here. God didn't take Pharaoh's heart, or let me put it like this. Pharaoh was not a tender-hearted, sweet fella who just wanted to turn to God and desired to turn to God and was so happy to have Moses come down into Egypt to deliver the children of Israel because Pharaoh wanted to do something for them. And then God hardened his heart, and it was mean of God to harden the heart of this wonderful, lovely Pharaoh. Well, if that's the way you read it, friends, then you're not reading this right. Harden here actually means, it's a very figurative word, I'm told, it means like a rope that is twisted. It means God twisted the heart of Pharaoh. 
And why did he twist it? Well, he was going to squeeze out what was in it. The rebellion was in there, but he was covering it up all the time. You know, that is one of the things today that I guess makes a politician. Politician is really not to say what he thinks. He's to defer it. He's to find out how the people think. And he won't come out and say it. Yet in his heart he feels one way, but he won't speak out on that. And there are a great many people like that today. They compromise and won't come out on it. Actually, that's the position Pharaoh wanted to take. Pharaoh did not want to let the children of Israel go. Yet he wanted to appear as a very benevolent ruler and wanted to be known as one who was very generous. Yet in this particular matter, he was hard. Well, God's going to make him come out with that. In other words, it's as if God's bringing him into court and making him. You know, there's certain men that have to be taken into court and made to do what they've agreed to do. And a man here in Los Angeles who's a contractor, he told me that he had to take a certain man into court and make him do the thing that he agreed that he would do. He wouldn't do it, but he took him into court. Now, that's exactly it. He hardened the man's heart. In other words, he made this man's heart firm to reveal what was really in it by his actions. Pharaoh had to face up to it. And that's what God is doing here to Pharaoh. That's what it means to harden Pharaoh's heart. And therefore, God sends Moses and Aaron in, and Pharaoh now is going to have to put it on the line. God's hailing him into court. God is saying, you're going to reveal the thing that is actually in your heart. You can't say one thing and do something else. God's going to force his hand in this particular matter. Now, that is the way that it's to be understood and not the idea that, dear old Pharaoh, he was a generous-hearted old fella. He's like old King Cole who called for his... Well, I can't even repeat that any longer. And he called for his fiddlers three. Just a jolly old King Cole. The fact of the matter is... Pharaoh is this kind of a man, and God's going to make him reveal it. And by the way, that's exactly what God's going to do with every individual. Someday when you come into his presence, you'll be seen as you really are. There'll be no more camouflage, nothing phony. You'll be just as you are. We shall know even as we're known then. And that is something that's rather frightening, is it not, for some of us. But this is a very important matter here for us to nail down at the very beginning. And I've taken time to do that here concerning this matter. And Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring mine armies and my people and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. That's verse 4 of the 7th of Exodus. Now, verse 5, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. In other words, Pharaoh will stand revealed, and then God will be revealed. And the Egyptians will know, and the children of Israel will have it confirmed, and Moses and Aaron will be justified. Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old, and Aaron fourscore and three years old, when they spake unto Pharaoh. You see, Aaron's three years older than Moses. Now verse 8, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Now, what happens here is that they're to use Aaron's rod in this particular connection. And the thing Pharaoh will ask for is, Where are your credentials? You've come here before me to make this very excessive demand upon me. What are your credentials? And God says, now this will be your credential. That rod Moses had, you remember. 
Now we find here in verse 10, "...and Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent." Now the word serpent here, there's been some question about that because there's not very much in Egypt on the snake as there is on other animals. And the word here actually is the word crocodile, for there were many of them in the Nile River and in many of the ponds in that day. I was told that there were quite a few that were still in that land. I didn't see any when I was there, but I was told they were there. Well, that's what you have here. You have a crocodile. The rod is changed to a crocodile. And you will find out all the way through this, we're dealing with the whole realm of zoology. That is, the gods of the Egyptians were animal or bird or something like that. And as Paul put it, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And they symbolized, of course, everything. And they took an abstract idea and put it into concrete or into an image. And they had deities which represented every phase and function of life. They didn't miss a thing. And they had changed monotheism into polytheism. And as Sir Wallace Budge has put it like this, they believed in the existence of one great God, self-produced, self-existence, almighty and eternal. But what happened was they held that this being was too great and mighty to concern himself with the affairs and destinies of human beings, and that he had permitted the management of this world to fall into the hands of hordes of gods and demons and good and bad spirits. And that's what they believed. And that's the thing that Paul, you remember, found when he went to Athens. There was that monument to the unknown God. Man doesn't actually know the living and true God, worshiping all of these different things. And we find out now that here is this that is against already one of the gods of Egypt. The Hebrew word here is tannin and is nowhere else in the Bible translated serpent. But right here in this particular section, it's rendered dragon over in Isaiah and Ezekiel, and it actually is satanic in its meaning. And that's the reason I suppose our translators translated it by the word serpent here. Well, regardless of that, and I'm not concerned about going into the meaning of Hebrew words here, other than just to make this statement that the thing that the Egyptians worshipped was the crocodile, among others. They didn't miss an animal, of course. And this animal occupied a very large place in the worship and the religion of Egypt. The god Sebek, S-E-B-E-K, was said to be incarnated in crocodiles. And Apep, A-P-E-P, was the perpetual arch enemy of all the solar gods appeared in the form of a crocodile. Now, they had, for instance, a magical ritual that they went through in the temple of Amun-Ra at Thebes. And it was a ritual that attempted to destroy Apep. You see, he was a terrible monster that lived in the nethermost parts of heaven, and he endeavored every day to prevent the rising of the sun god Ra and to stir up lightning and thunder and tempests and storms and hurricanes and rain and to obscure the light of the sun by filling the sky with clouds and mists and fog and blackness. And this was actually a worship in Egypt and was a very prominent worship. And the very first thing, God now delivers a blow at this. Here, this rod now is changed into a crocodile. And what happened, though, and this is the amazing thing that happens when Moses and Aaron did this, 
Verse 11, Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. Now, they duplicated this miracle. I don't know how they did it. Don't ask me that. But Paul says over in 2 Timothy 3.8, and we've referred to this before, Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You see, they could duplicate it, and I think imitate it, by the way. But whatever it was, why, they made a pretty good show of it. And because of that, they resisted the living and true God. But God's not through with them, of course. Now, verse 12, "...for they cast down every man his rod, and they became crocodiles. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods." Now, that's the interesting thing. Now, they have worshipped the crocodile. But this rod in the hands of Aaron swallows up the other. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Instead of this impressing Pharaoh, it didn't. It just hardened him. He was set in his way, and he just persisted in it. Now, verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink, against he come, and the rod which was turned to a serpent or to a crocodile shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldst not hear. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that's in the river shall die, and the river shall stink. And the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, stretch out thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, upon their ponds, upon their pools of water. And there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood, vessels of stone. Now, this is what they did. Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded. He lifted up his rod and smote the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of the servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. This is a blow again at the worship in Egypt, as we have indicated before, that this is called the first plague, by the way. The first miracle was the rod, of course. But here you have the Nile now turned to blood. And this river was sacred to Osiris. But that doesn't exhaust it all. Actually, the god of the Nile was Hapi, H-A-P-I. And the Egyptians depicted him in the form of a man with the breasts of a woman, which indicated that the god's powers of fertility and nourishment were there, you see. And there was a hymn that they sang in the temple of that day to Hapi. And it went something like this, Thou waterest the fields which Ra created. Thou art the bringer of food, the creator of all things. Thou fillest the storehouses. Thou hast care for the poor and needy. You see that the river was the lifeblood of the nation, but it had to be water to be lifeblood. Now it's blood, and it becomes death to them. And this is definitely, you see, judgment. Now, here's the amazing thing, friends. Verse 22, "...and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians did around about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after that the Lord had smitten the rivers. This plague lasted for seven days, and yet Pharaoh's not convinced because his own magicians were able to duplicate this. Don't ask me how they did it. 
I don't know. It's satanic, if you please. And I'm of the opinion we're beginning to see the manifestation of Satan again in our midst. We'll have occasion to talk about that later. Now, as we come to chapter 8, why we see again the next plague that's going to come upon the land of Egypt, and that's going to be the frogs. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I'll smite all thy borders with frogs, and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly. And they'll go up and come into thine house, into thy bedchamber, upon thy bed, into the house of thy servants, upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. Get in the kitchen even, and the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. You see, the land of Egypt was the place of zoolatry. They worshipped all kinds of animals. And this one of the frogs is an example of it. And we saw that last time. I'd like to add a little bit more to it. The frogs actually were represented, of course, by Hika, as we mentioned last time. And Hika was a frog-headed goddess. But also there was Hapi, H-A-P-I, and he was the bestower of nourishment. And they always depicted him, that is, the Egyptians, as holding a frog out of his mouth that flowed with a stream of nourishment. And this, I think, shows the close relationship between the god of the Nile and Hika, the frog goddess, who was one of the oldest mother goddesses. She was the goddess of fertility and rebirth and the patroness of midwives. One Egyptian picture shows this frog-headed goddess reciting spells to effect the resurrection of Osiris. And a carving shows Hika kneeling before the queen and superintending at the birth of Hathsepset. Now, the frogs were very common in the land of Egypt. And so we find here this plague leveled against them. Now, they were sacred. You didn't kill them. But when you get up of a morning, as we said before, and as it says here, they were in the bed, and they were in every room in the home. They were in the kitchen, in the kneading troughs, in the ovens. And I tell you, when they're sacred and you can't kill them, you really got a problem with frogs. And we suggested last time that probably God was smiling. But now we come to the most amazing thing of all. Now, this is a great miracle, but notice what happened as we read on. Verse 6, And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Now, listen to this. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Now, the magicians could duplicate this. This is an amazing thing, by the way, and it reveals the power of Satan. And this is satanic power. Verse 8, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me, and from my people, and I let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and of thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow, and he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses, from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. Now, this is a miracle that was duplicated by the magicians. Now, notice further on. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, 
and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. And when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said." Now, we get here a more comprehensive picture of the hardening. It says here, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. You see, all God did was just bring out what was already in a hard heart, and that was to demonstrate that it was a hard heart. Now, he did not repent even after this. And, of course, the very fact his own magicians could duplicate it. Now, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now note this, and this is interesting. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now, up to this point, the magicians were able to duplicate every miracle, but they're not able to duplicate this. Well, How had they done the others? Well, I must confess, I don't know. But it raises the question, were they fakes? Were they really magicians in our understanding of it? Was it a trick that they were performing? Well, at least at this juncture, they acknowledge the finger of God, and as it were, God is gradually convincing them. But notice this plague of lice again. The plague of lice was that which actually had to do with the earth god, Keb, or Geb. The judgment, of course, brought loathing upon Geb, the earth god. And he's closely related to the earth in all of its states. Geb was the one who made his report to Osiris on the state of the harvest, and from him came an emanation of holy oil, in which the backbone was immersed in the work of making a dummy. So you see that this thing entered into the very life of these Egyptians. Actually, this word lice, though, could mean gnats or mosquitoes. Gesenius made that alteration, by the way. And the root meaning means to cover or to nip or to pinch. And the very interesting thing is that nipping or pinching or covering. I don't think that a mosquito could fulfill all that, or actually a gnat, but certainly lice would. Here is a statement made by a leading zoologist. He says, "...the mites form an enormous order whose function in life is a large extent to play the scavenger." Well, now, you can well understand with all those frogs around, And the record here says that the land was smelling bad, and these gnats could eventually get rid of them. They could become a blessing as well as a curse also. Now, we have this word, though, that was given by Mr. Bednell, and he tells about his experience in the land of Egypt. And I think this is quite interesting in connection with the lies. He says, I noticed that the sand appeared to be in motion. Closer inspection revealed that the surface of the ground was a moving mass of minute ticks, thousands of which were crawling up my legs. I beat a hasty retreat, pondering the words of the Scriptures. The dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. The miracle now is one that could not be duplicated. God's beginning to level it against the very life in the land of Egypt. Now let's move on here in verse 20. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, 
Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I'll send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, upon thy people, into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end. Thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. You see, up to this sign, this plague, why, it had been on the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were. And a great many people were probably telling Pharaoh, well, after all, they are suffering as well as our people. It's obvious that this is not from God, but has a natural explanation. Or maybe one of our gods happens to be doing this. Well, now, in this plague, God makes a distinction. From here on, none of the plagues will touch the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel are, and the judgment will be upon the land of Egypt. Now, this is the judgment of the flies. That of the lice was against the earth god. But now the flies are actually here. Their beetles are scarabs, as they are known in Egypt. Many of them are gold that they found in the tombs in Egypt. They are sacred to Ra, the sun god, Ra Ammon, and also to Kippara. These are the gods now that are being reached through this. And that which to the Egyptian was sacred, a place of worship, and now he's touching the main god and goddess of the land of Egypt, Ra Ammon. And it causes Pharaoh at this time to want to reach some sort of a compromise with Moses. And notice now the proposal that Pharaoh did. I'm reading verse 24 now of the 8th of Exodus. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And actually, that scarab spoke of eternal life. You find them in the tombs today. They were sacred, as I say. Well, imagine this most sacred thing becoming a curse to the people and certainly a plague on all the land. So Pharaoh wants to work out a compromise. And you have two of them here. You'll find out later he'll make two more compromises, four compromises in all. And here is the first one. Now, verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. You remember now, Moses and Aaron said, We want to go three days' journey in the wilderness and sacrifice. But now Pharaoh said, All right, sacrifice, but do so in the land. Now, notice this. And Moses said, it's not meat so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. Now, this compromise, first one of Pharaoh, is the same kind of a compromise that is given to Christians today. And it's always satanic. And this first compromise is just simply this. It says, be a Christian, and we think that's very nice for you to be a Christian, but don't be a narrow Christian. Be broad-minded. fact of the matter is, what they really mean is, don't change your life. And friends, if you don't change your life, you're not a Christian, you see. Now, don't come back and say to me, well, now you're saying that you have to perform good works to be a Christian. No, I don't say it that way. May I say this, that you're saved by faith in Christ and nothing else and works is excluded. 
But if you have put saving faith in Christ, it'll change your life. And that's where conduct comes in. You see, Christianity believes that the life should be changed and the conduct should be changed. But you've got to change the inner man first and not the outward man. That is the thing that's all important. And this is the kind of compromise that you hear today. And right now, my point is that we have a church that's pretty well compromised. It's still in the land of Egypt. You can't tell the difference today between the average Christian and the average man of the world. You see them in business. You see them in social gatherings. When I hear the fact that over 50 percent of the citizens of the United States are members of some religious body. And then I am in public places today. I looked on the plane the other day, and they were serving cocktails. And I like to do something that's past the time. And I just began to count the people that were having cocktails. And I decided that that would be too big an undertaking. I just counted those that didn't. I would say that in the plane there were less than four people that did not take cocktails. Now, friends, there must have been some church members on there. And if they are, they are sacrificing in the land of Egypt. They are broad-minded. They don't want to be squares. They want to live like the world. Friends, we are in a race today, and it's a race with two horses. One's a black horse, one's a white horse. And you put one foot on one and one foot on the other one, and you're going to make a strange discovery. They're both going the opposite direction. And you've got to make up your mind which one you're going with. And here you find that Moses will not accept this. He says, we'll go three days' journey in the wilderness. And then Pharaoh comes up with his second one here. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only ye shall not go very far away and treat for me. Well, now, this is just a shade difference than the other. He says, don't go very far away. Also, entreat for me. And again, this is the same sort of a compromise. Only today we find that a great many churches, even fundamental churches, are adopting the program of the world. They are running their entire program on the basis of banquets and promotion and that sort of thing. Yes, they fundamentally say they believe the book, but they're not very far away, you see. They're very much like the world. And you honestly can't tell the difference between some churches today and the Rotary Club or any of these other knife and fork clubs. They're about the same. There's not much difference. And they're made up, I would say, largely of those that do not know what it is really to trust Christ. Now, that's not satisfactory. Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I'll entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people, and there remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Now, that's important to see, friends, because it's Pharaoh that's hardening his heart, actually. All God is doing is making him reveal what is already in his heart. 